Thank you for joining us for another segment of Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and I'm delighted to host another discussion about how diplomacy has impacted US history. Our program today is about the importance of international waterways and how they connect countries, whether in trade or travel. Open waterways are important today and have historic and have historically been critical to the success of a nation. And today's topic, the Suez Canal crisis of 1956, certainly hi highlights this fact. We most recently published a diplomacy simulation for students that invites them to play the role of, the, of diplomats in this crisis. So whether you are a teacher interested in bringing the simulation to your students, or you are a student preparing for your National History Day project with the theme of debate and diplomacy, this program is for you. And if you're not able to stay for the entire program, no worries, we are recording this segment. So come back to our website, diplomacy.state.gov to watch the program in its entirety or let others know who perhaps were not able to join us today to know that this program's link will be on our website. And follow us on social media at NAMAD Museum uh, so you can learn about future programs. And finally, we are taking uh, uh, questions at the end of the presentation today. So our producer, Elizabeth, is monitoring the chat. So if you have thoughts and questions, please populate that and she will make sure that we receive those at the conclusion of the presentation. All right, so the original draft of the Suez Canal crisis simulation was first penned by then Department of State intern, Tizok Chavez who is now historian Dr. Chavez. We were thrilled to have his guidance and scholarship as we finalized that simulation and are incredibly honored to have him join our program today. So welcome to the program, Tisok. Hi, Lorna, thanks. Great, uh, it's great to be here. It's my pleasure. Um, you have such fond memories of being an intern, so it's really great to be back. I certainly enjoyed working with you when you were at Department of State, and I'm so psyched that our simulation is finally published and available for students to, um, to participate in. But you've been actually up to some really interesting things since you've left the Department of State. Elizabeth's going to drop your biography in the chat so others can learn about what you've been up to. And I would like to mention um, one of those things as you've authored a book. Uh, the Diplomatic Presidency, foreign, uh, American Foreign Policy from FDR to George H.W. Bush. And that book is forthcoming in December. So okay. congratulations. Um, that's quite an accomplishment. So clearly the perfect historian to guide our conversation about the Suez Canal crisis of 1956. Um, so, Dr. Chavez, before we jump into sort of this 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 event and really what what happened, I thought maybe you could offer for us why historians look at this event and what makes it relevant. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the Suez Crisis is really a great example of how crises often involve more than one nation. Um, so here you're going to have six kind of key nations involved, and each one you know at different levels of power, different um, you know interests, objectives. And they'll go about trying to achieve those in different ways as well. Um, and even, you know, if you have, even with allies, you can diverge on, on your, your interest. And that's also an example that comes up in this case as well. Um, and when you think about, you know, crises today or diplomacy today, it usually doesn't involve just, um, you know, one country's probably not going to decide some major international event, maybe not even two countries. Uh, it's going to take the, the effort of multiple countries involved. And so I think this provides a good example, a good reminder um, that multiple countries can play a role in, um, you know, international affairs, crises, not just countries might consider uh, great powers. Um, and also, I think it's a good example of how international events can evolve, because um, mm. I'm sure we'll get into this, but, um, you know, in a lot of ways, the, the origins for this starts kind of in, in an arms sale to, to Egypt, and then it ends up being this major uh, crisis over this international waterway. Excellent. Wow. And I just want to offer for our audience that that notion of diplomacy, where we 
have um, an opportunity where many partners work together to solve problems. And so I know that your discussion today really highlights how these multiple partners involved work together. And I know that we do have a slide deck that will help to guide that conversation. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share it um, because, hold on one second here as I pull up that slide deck. Um, because it does offer some, can you see my slide deck? I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Hold on, Dr. Chavez. And so I can pull up the right, um, hmm. hold on one second. I apologize for this. That's not what I want to be looking at. Hold on. Let me come over here. All right. Hold on. We got this. I'm gonna to go to the top, I think. Huh. Okay. There we go. I think it's loading up. Because I know we have a lot of images to draw us to. Okay, sorry about that, but we're back on track. We're loading with our title slide. All right, here we go. Um, but. As we dig in, I thought maybe you could offer us a little bit of a backdrop. This is 1956, so it's about 10 years or so after the end of World War II. So what's going on in the world? Yeah, so one of the things that makes the Suez Crisis so interesting and complex is that it is really like this kind of confluence of three major global historical developments. So uh, on the first hand, you have the process of decolonization. Uh, and so World War II, had weakened many of the imperial powers uh, and the post four years saw independence from many former colonies in places like Asia and Africa. Uh, and you can see from this map too, much of Africa, even in 1954, is still under uh, European control. Um, so European countries, imperial powers didn't really go easily, go quietly in many instances and try to um, you know, reassert their control over uh, their former colonies, but uh, the, the trend was towards independence. Uh, and though Egypt was never an official British colony, um, since the late uh, 1800, Britain had played an outsized role uh, in Egyptian politics, um, you know, partly through the canal and other things as well. Um, and in 1952, you will get a group of um, nationalist military officers who will overthrow the pro-British king in Egypt, uh, and they will be really bent on trying to get rid of foreign influence, um, you know, in Egypt. Uh, the second kind of major um, historical development of this period is the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so less than a decade prior to the Suez crisis in 1948, uh, Israel will declare its independence, um, and then it will go to war right away with its Arab neighbors, including, including Egypt. Um, and what's, what you have here in, in 1956 is kind of an uneasy armistice. Um, there are still, Israel still suffers from um, border raids by Egypt or by Palestinian, Palestinian militants in Egypt and some other um, Arab neighbors. Um, but obviously that's, that's a conflict there. And then lastly, um, you have uh, the Cold War. And so that's the, right, the superpower global competition between uh, the United States and its allies, the Western Bloc, and the Soviet Union um, and its allies, the Eastern Bloc. And though the United States and Soviet Union never um, went to direct confrontation, they did fight lots of proxy wars. And so there's always this concern that regional crises, regional flare-ups might get drawn into uh, this larger superpower competition and lead to a direct confrontation. And so that's kind of the concern here where you have on um, this process of decolonization, um, nationalist movements, as well as the Arab-Israeli conflict and how those might get, um, you know, brought into this Cold War competition. So that is, you know, one of the great concerns uh, during this crisis. And the interesting thing too is each of the actors we'll talk about, um, they kind of put a priority on one of those factors over the others. Um, so some might be more concerned with the Arab Israeli conflict, others the Cold War, uh, others kind of, um, you know, freeing your, um, themselves of um, foreign interference. Uh, and so, yeah, it's really this kind of combustible mix of all three of those developments. That's excellent. And I, I really liked how you certainly isolated those three points, but brought our attention to that every country might have their different level of interest within those three points. So that's a, that's a really good um, uh, fact to remember. I want to just draw our audience's attention to my cursor on the screen because here's Egypt. There's the Sinai Peninsula. 
Peninsula and that the Suez Canal is right at the tip here, sort of between Sinai and Egypt. And I wanted to move to the next slide where we have sort of a, a highlight of that, where you can see where that Suez, um, the, the Gulf of Suez really connects the Indian Ocean with the Mediterranean. So that's a, it's a really important waterway here. And Dr. Chavez, is, if you could help us understand, because in this story, the Suez Canal Company is like at main focus here. So can you tell us a little bit about what the Suez Canal Company is? Yeah, so going back just a little bit, um, the canal itself was built in the 1860s, took 10 years to build, but um, built in the 1860s, it was um, under French management with uh, you know, Egyptian uh, partnership there. Uh, so the canal itself was Egyptian, um, guaranteed as an international waterway, open to all nations through a um, international treaty in the late uh, 19th century. Um, but the canal is operated kind of this unusual private firm, the Suez Canal Company, uh, which is headquartered in Paris. And in the late 19th century, Britain um, will um, acquire a large stakeholder in this company. Um, and so, yeah, Britain, France kind of are the main shareholders in this company. Um, the canal itself is about 120 miles long. Mm. Um, and it's surrounded by um, the canal zone and within the canal zone is various um, infrastructure. So railroads, um, warehouses, um, harbors, things like that kind of surround the, the canal zone at this point. And Britain has a very large military um, you know, operation there in the canal zone to protect it and maintain British interests. About 80,000 troops are actually in there. British troops are in there. And so the canal company itself operates it, runs it. Um, and it is a product of or controlled by, you know, Britain and French uh, investors there. Now, interestingly, uh, in 1954, um, you know, two years before the crisis, then um, British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden, who will become prime minister during the crisis, he actually negotiates with Egypt to remove um, that British military presence from the canal. Um, and can, from his perspective, times are changing and um, the UK needs to be a bit adaptable. Uh, and so you can imagine that was a great, um, you know, accomplishment for the, the nationalist government there in Egypt. Uh, but it's interesting that the, the position that Eden takes in 1954 kind of versus what he'll do uh, a few years later. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we have the Suez Canal Company, but really the start of our particular story starts with the president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser. So Nasser does something. Tell us what he does. Yeah, so... On a basic level, Nasser will nationalize that Suez Canal Company and, and basically take control of it from, um, from the British and the French. Uh, and, and by doing so, take control of the canal's operations. Um, that move is wildly popular in Egypt uh, and the rest of the Arab world. Um, I think we have a photo. Um, yep, we yeah. do. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's very popular in Egypt and the rest of the Arab world. And as you can see there, this photo is him on the way to raise the Egyptian flag over the canal zone. So. That's on a basic level what it does, nationalize it, takes control of the canal's operations. But to really kind of understand um, why he did that, I uh, kind of have to go back a little bit, go back about a year. Um, in 1954, Egypt, um, unable to acquire uh, military arms from the West, uh, turned to the Soviet Union. And the Soviets are more than happy to provide him with a massive arms deal. Uh, I believe they provide him with fighter jets, fighter bombers, artillery tanks, just a lots, lots of weaponry. Uh, it's a massive, massive deal there. And obviously this causes great concern among um, many countries. So from the United States perspective, um, this might give the Soviets a foothold in a region they hadn't really been that active in before. Um, same thing, same, similar thoughts for, for Britain. Um, Israel's worried about um, this new influx of weaponry that Egypt's gonna possess and maybe it might tilt the balance of power in their favor against, against their country. Um, but interestingly, the United States and Britain, they still wanna try to work with Nasser. They're hoping at this point to maybe still entice him, you know, away from the Soviets uh, and to the Western camp. Um, and so to do that, they offer to fund a major developmental project Nasser's interested in, um, the Aswan Dam. Mm -hmm. And the, the dam, what the dam's going to do, uh, hopefully for Egypt, uh, is really um, increase or control irrigation and uh, electrical output. And so this would hopefully um, increase the farm farmland in Egypt as well as industrial output. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of the what. The, the dam, by funding the dam, the goal is, you know, help Egypt and then help Egypt move to kind of the, the Western side camp. 
Well, I was just going to say in diplomatic terms, with the U.S. agreeing to fund the Aswan Dam, that would be considered sort of an enticement or a carrot, if you will, right? Um, this is what I will do for you if you sort of step foot into my camp, kind of, um, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that they didn't want them to uh, do anything with the Soviets. Yeah, exactly. Because you can imagine, as you said, like if, if that's the carrot, they could have potentially done the opposite, right? Use, use a stick and try to, um, you know, really coerce um, Nasser, but they felt that at this stage, trying to entice him was a better option. And so they offer this funding. Um, but over the year, um, relations kind of sour. Um, so one, Nasser is going to recognize communist China. And, you know, in, in the Cold War context, that does not make the United States happy. The um, United States at this time is also trying to engage in um, a peace initiative with the Arab countries and Israel. And Nasser is not seen as being particularly um, helpful in that regard. And there's also some domestic concern for um, for the United States. You know, you can imagine, and in the UK too, I would say, you can imagine um, a lot of people say, well, this this individual is not particularly pro-Western, not really pro, pro-US, so why are we giving him, you know, a lot of money for this project? Um, there's also some concern that if Egypt increases its agricultural production, that would then maybe hurt US farmers. So for these variety of factors, the United States decides we're gonna pull funding um, for the dam. Um, Nasser doesn't, you know, he expects that. He's not really surprised by it. But what does hurt is the way in which the United States does it. So Secretary of State John Foster Dulles um, says the reason that funding is being pulled is because Egypt can't handle it, basically. Egypt's economies, you know, they can't handle this big infrastructure project. And that's humiliating for, for Nasser, for Egypt. And also the United States didn't really give them a heads up about why the announcement and why they're going to do it. And so Egypt didn't really have a good chance to respond uh, or get a good response ahead of time before this news uh, was public. And so you could say for, for Nasser to maybe reassert his, his independence, um, his standing at home, um, he's got to nationalize the canal, which will then also help him get funds uh, to fund the Aswan Dam, which again, no longer has international backing. Got it. So this is shaping up to be a very complicated situation, but it does help uh, us to better understand his motivations, Nasser's motivations for wanting to nationalize the, the Suez Canal Company. But who cares? What's at stake uh, if he, you know, uh, if, if Egypt is running the dam? You know, I mean, I understand Britain and France lose perhaps some of the, the money that come from um, charging folks or ships that move through it. But other than that, like, really, who cares about who's in control of this this canal? Yeah, that's a great question. So from the Western perspective, especially like um, uh, the United Kingdom, what they're really concerned about is, is oil. One of the main things they're concerned about is oil because the Suez Canal is the main transit point for Middle Eastern oil, making it to, to Europe. And so at this point in time, um, you know, the United States, they're self-sufficient. They don't, they don't need Middle Eastern oil, but their allies do, allies in Western Europe do, and they are you know, committed to helping them maintain that access to oil. Uh, I believe uh, of the 2 million barrels of oil that Western Europe was using daily in this period, uh, 1.3 billion went through, um, uh, I'm sorry, 1.3 million went through uh, the Suez Canal. So you can see a lot, a lot of oil is going through there. And if there was any disruption, that would be really devastating for um, the oil supplies for those countries. Um, so that's on one hand. And this cartoon really gets a good, I think, yeah. illustrate that, that idea, right? That the concern is that by controlling the canal, Nasser might cut off um, oil supplies for um, for the world and have a lot of, a lot of control there. And also, too, if the canal is is not operating, um, then these ships would have to go around Africa, which would add about six thousand miles to their journey. So that's a huge concern um, for these countries. Also, for Britain, kind of more from a more personal side, um, you know, the canal was seen as part of you know kind of British power, um, you know, and, and prestige, and by you know getting it seized by Nasser, it hurts their prestige. Um, and again, you can see the canal is being harkening back to the days when they were this dominant empire. Uh, and Britain still does have a lot of contacts in, uh, in the kind of Indian Ocean, which the Suez Canal provides a good route to. Um, and so for those reasons, it is problematic from a British perspective. And then lastly, just think about the United States, what's at stake for them. Um, this action potentially opens the door for more Soviet meddling in the region. Again, the United States wants to keep the Soviets out. Um, but, you know, this might give their allies, Britain, France, right, um, a, a reason to take some kind of action that might be detrimental 
to the U.S. overall objective of stability and, and trying to uh, avoid Soviet meddling. Man, you, you are really highlighting all of these different competing interests here. Um, so I, I love this next slide that you've dropped in here, which really helps to illustrate how all of these different superpowers and countries are going to respond to this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, you know what you see here is really um, the, those, those different nations involved and kind of how they, they saw the crisis from kind of different lenses and, and the way they, they went to approach it. Um, so as you see there on the right, um, that's, that's supposed to be um, U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles playing that peace harp, um, because from the very beginning, the United States is really interested in a peaceful solution. They're, they're not really willing to go to war over this. They don't think, that, now again, I shouldn't say the United States likes what's happened, uh, but they just don't think it's a, an issue that war is, is needed. Um, Britain there, that uh, individual is supposed to be um, Prime Minister Anthony Eden. Um, the British are shocked, um, you know, the strikes really at the heart of their, their power and prestige. And so on one hand, you know, they're willing to go along with diplomacy initially and partly to satisfy the United States. Um, but at the same time, they're also making the preparations for, for military action. Uh, and then France, that's supposed to be the France, uh, French Prime Minister uh, Guy Mollet, um, they were probably the most militaristic, interestingly, um, from the beginning. Um, and we talk about that in a second of why, but um, yeah, so you have, United States trying to stay on board, same page with their two allies. Both allies are sort of negotiating or engaging in diplomacy, but they're also uh, making military plans, which the, again, the United States is mm -hmm. pretty much, um, you know, totally opposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, and the challenge really here is that what Nasser did was perfectly legal. Most, most would all agree in the United States and in Britain, um, because what Nasser did was nationalize an Egyptian company and he planned to compensate the shareholders and there was no disruption in canal operations, right? The canal continued to operate as normal. Uh, and so, you know, that kind of takes away, you know, the, the motive or the, the incentive, or I should say the justification uh, maybe for military action if everything's basically going the same way and it's a legal maneuver. Great, okay. So you can really see where, uh, you know, you need to be a skilled diplomat to enter into this situation. So let's just talk about a little bit of the, the sort of the diplom, you know, the, the people and the diplomatic approaches involved here. We have this slide here that really um, humanizes who all these people are. It gives a face to everyone. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the folks here and maybe how they were having these um bilateral or sidebar conversations with each other to try to motivate their own interests. Yeah, so it's sort of kind of the, the photo of Nasser and Khrushchev. So Nasser, they're obviously the Egyptian president, um, and Khrushchev is the leader of the Soviet Union. Um, Nasser, if it isn't clear maybe from that earlier photo, um, very charismatic individual, great orator, um, you know, legions of, of fans. Um, Khrushchev himself, he could be a little, um, a little rude, uh, a little belligerent, um, but he also could display levels of charm and kind of playful combatantness. Uh, so he's, he's quite the character himself. Um, but interestingly, just kind of think about the, the perspectives of these, each of these countries as well. Um, the Soviets really don't have a big stake in the Suez Canal. Um, they don't use it that much. But this, this opportunity or this crisis does provide them an opportunity to potentially, you know, get closer to Egypt and gain a foothold in a region. So, again, they don't, it's interesting, they don't have a, a big stake here in the canal, but they, they're using this crisis maybe to, to benefit them in another manner. Mm -hmm. um, up top, you have uh, Eden, who is the friend of the, sorry, the British Prime Minister, uh, and he's there with uh, French Prime Minister Guy Mollet. And Eden, uh, you can see there kind of his, well, you can see his characteristic uh, mustache. He was always, um, you know, very dapper and, and considered very charming, but also very thin skinned um, and maybe a little prone to nervousness. Um, and so, yeah, British and France, they're going to, um, you know, we'll talk about this in a second, but kind of get together to formulate a military plan. Uh, but at this stage, right, Britain, um, the prestige, they feel the prestige is threatened globally um, and in the region. Uh, threats to the oil supply, right? Threats the economy. And so for them, if they can't control the canal, they're really interested in international control. They don't want Nasser to be the individual in, um, in control because they don't trust him. Uh, so they do want that international control there. Um, from the French perspective, they are also um, a declining imperial power. Mm -hmm. um, they all, again, they own shares in the canal as well. So that's obviously a concern. Um, but really one of the things that makes them so upset is Algeria. So um, at this point, Algeria, also Northern Africa, is a French colony. 
And actually, I really say more than a colony. France really saw Algeria as kind of part of France. And they blame Nasser for assisting rebels uh, in Algeria trying to throw off French control. So they, they're very upset with Nasser even before the, the seizure of the canal. And uh, that's, I think, explains one of the reasons why they are some of the mo more militaristic from the beginning, because uh, they really see him as a threat to, uh, to Algeria, um, as well as obviously um, the canal there. Uh, and then lastly there, you have uh, David Ben-Gurion, who is the Israeli prime minister, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And Ben-Gurion, longest serving, uh, or was the longest serving um, Israeli prime minister, I believe, until Benjamin Netanyahu, um, considered the father of, of the nation, uh, played a major role, obviously, in independence. Um, but for Israel, interestingly, they also don't really have much of a, <laughs> um, a stake in the canal. They don't use it. Um, Israel, even though um, Egypt... Um, basically blocks them from using the canal, even though the canal should be open to all nations, but, you know, he blocks them from doing that. Um, but whether Egypt or Israel is going to use this crisis again to, to kind of further its own aims, and they see Egypt as an existential threat. Um, I mentioned the arms sales that the Soviets had given to, um, to Egypt. Uh, the concern for Israel is that over time, once uh, Egypt is able to absorb all those weapons, uh, they're going to then turn them on, on Israel. Also, um, Nasser blocks the, the Straits of Turin. And so if you imagine where the Suez Canal is, uh, go east of there on the other side of the Sinai, there's some straits, which mm -hmm. provides access to Israel's only southern port and their access to the Red Sea. Nasser has blocked that as well. Um, I mentioned earlier, kind of supports um, Palestinian raids on um, Egyptian territory. So for Egypt, for Israel, right, um, Egypt is kind of seen as this major threat um, outside of the canal. And then obviously for the United States there, you have Dwight Eisenhower, um, you know, this, you see this kind of avuncular, affable figure, but interestingly, Eisenhower behind closed doors really did have quite a temper, which did flare uh, during this crisis because he is very mad at his allies for eventually um, keeping him in the dark about their plan and eventually deciding to use uh, military force. But the United States, as that kind of superpower, does have lots of um, interest here that they have to worry about. Because um, again, I should note, they don't, they don't like Nasser, don't support the Nazization, but they don't, just don't see it as the same threat as um, Britain and France and does. Because, you know, Britain and France see Hitler, I'm sorry, um, see Nasser as kind of like this Hitler figure, a Mussolini figure who needs to be stopped, this big threat to world peace. The United States doesn't see him like that. Um, they're more concerned about stability, trying to keep the Soviets out of the region. Um, they are interested in keeping oil flowing as well to help out their allies. And so they don't want the allies to do anything basically chew themselves in the foot and do anything that be counterproductive and maybe inflame, um, right, um, the feelings of Arab nationalists against um, not only them, right, Britain and France, but also maybe the United States as well, because they are allies. So yeah, lots of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, of things going there. And strong characters involved, including Nasser himself. So mm -hmm. where you have a lot of these, you know, bilateral discussions happening, you also have sort of the arena of the UN, right? And I love this picture of um, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles there. Can you tell us a little bit about anything that was happening within the UN to address what was going on? Yeah, so actually, I'll just go back one thing, as you mentioned, uh, that kind of bilateral um, relation. So during the crisis, um, the leaders are exchanging a lot of letters, especially, you know, Eisenhower is writing a lot with Eden, and they, they knew each other, you know, back from the war days. Uh, World War II. And so, yeah, they're, they're exchanging lots of uh, communications, a lot of lower level uh, diplomatic interactions be, um, between um, the nations. And then, yeah, you also have this multilateral aspect. Um, and so the United States does kind of take the lead in trying to find a peaceful solution. Um, you know, Eisenhower kind of sets the broad parameters and then lets John Foster Dulles here um, kind of take the lead in trying to implement America's um, policies. And so the United States will have proposals for these two conferences um, that are going to involve multiple countries who have kind of a stake in the canal, and they're going to try to come up with some solution to satisfy, you know, all the parties involved. And basically, they're going to come up with the ideas of for um, this kind of international control of the canal or some kind of association of powers that would kind of operate the canal. Um, neither of these plans really sit with Egypt because, again, they're, they're interested in throwing off any type of foreign interfluent inter interference, and they would fear that any type of international consortium or international board would, again, like infringe upon Egyptian sovereignty. Um, and so those kind of fail. Here you have a picture of Dulles um, at the UN because the, the issue will be brought before the UN Security Council. Uh, it is brought by um, Britain and France, partly as a prelude to maybe using military force, because mm -hmm. um, Eden realized that if he's going to use force, he needs to at least say he went to the United Nations. 
um, before he did that. Uh, and I should note just Dulles is an interesting figure in himself. He was a, a lawyer, um, can you know, be very persuasive in the arguments he makes. Um, critics would say he's a little more, was a little bit moralistic, a little, um, you know, uh, he was religious and so maybe that influenced him as well. Uh, so he could rub some people the wrong way, though others would say in private, he was, he was a warm, you know, kind of um, friendly individual. Um, but in general, he was kind of seen as more of a, a brusque, a brusque figure, he was a little uh, moralistic. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, he did spend a ton of time trying to, to mediate this, um, this crisis, um, even though he, he, by the end of the conference, uh, the crisis would actually end up um, in the hospital. Um, he had uh, a tumor and um, he had to, had to get removed. And so before he went to surgery, he was still trying to deal with some of these issues related to uh, to the crisis. But um, yeah, I went to the United Nations Security Council. Um, it looked like there might be some kind of agreement that could be um, hatched, um, but there's still this insistence by Britain and France for international control of the canal, uh, which obviously is a, is a, is a non-starter for, for Nasser. So what happens? Does peace prevail? And I'm going to just advance the slide. Just uh, It might be a little bit of a, of a spoiler, but what happens? Yeah, so peace, peace does not prevail as that, um, <laughs> as that shows with the tank being unloaded. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, kind of French, France was the most militaristic of the um, countries kind of from the beginning, um, willing to maybe resort to military force a little bit sooner. And so they're gonna at first get together with the Israelis and then bring Britain along. Um, and all three of those countries are gonna kind of hatch this plan. And the idea is that Israel will attack Egypt uh, under kind of the pretext of self-defense, right? And there's, there's plenty of provocation that Israel could, could use. Um, they were going to go in, attack Egypt, and then Britain and France as being disinterested parties would issue an ultimatum, basically saying, telling both Egypt and Israel, you know, withdraw from the canal, uh, accept a, a, you know, a ceasefire, or withdraw from the canal. Um, but if you don't, or if one of the countries don't, then uh, Britain and France would, um, you know, militarily intervene to take control of the canal to protect it, right? Uh, and so that, that's, that's the plan that um, takes place. Israel attacks, um, Britain and France issues their ultimatum. Um, as the plan went, Israel accepts it, Egypt does not, uh, which, was, which was expected. And then that opens the door for um, you know, airstrikes by uh, France and Britain, and then eventually uh, the landing of ground troops to secure the canal um, under British and French uh, control. So I, I'm sorry, I just should note this, um, you know, thinking about Eisenhower's anger, he will be livid about this because, again, he was kept in the dark. Um, his allies, um, again, allies you should be in communication with, but they, they didn't tell him. And also, this is on the eve of a presidential election. So lo lots of reasons why Eisenhower is very angry about this. Oh, my goodness. Indeed. Hatched in private would, does not go over with an ally, right? Yeah. Um, so how does Nasser respond? So, yeah, Nasser, um, once... Britain and France do airstrikes, he is going to retaliate by sinking ships in the canal. Um, I think in total, there will be about 32 ships that are gonna be sunk um, to, to block access to it. Um, and so now, right, ships with oil, uh, Persian Gulf oil gonna mm. have to go all the way around Africa to, um, you know, to, to deliver the oil. And so you can see oil shortages for Western Europe um, are going to become uh, acute during this crisis. So basically, yeah, there's, there's a great photo there, um, basically, exactly what Britain didn't want to happen happens and the canal basically um, shuts down. So this is not what I'm sure France and Britain would, would, would thought that was going to happen. So how are they going to deal with this? So really as this, this card, it's a great cartoon because it kind of shows that it was a disaster really for, for Britain and France. Cause it was clear to everyone from the very beginning um, that this plan with, was concocted with, with Israel, right? They were all kind of in on it. Um, and so this is really gonna hurt Britain and France's uh, global uh, reputation. Um, the reputation in the region is gonna be um, shattered. And I don't know if I noticed this before, but Britain had been kind of the dominant, um, you know, Western power in the Middle East. Uh, and now that's obviously, uh, that's weakened and hurt. Um, economically, this is really gonna hurt Britain as well. Cause remember, um, they're gonna start to lose access to oil. Uh, and Eisenhower made a decision early on, he's not going to help them out. He's not going to provide them with any oil, um, which he might, you know, in a different type of crisis, but this is one of their own making. So he basically shut them off from any um, help with oil. And so, you know, the British economy is going to be kind of um, really on the, on the cusp of potentially failing there. 
Um, relations with the U.S. are greatly strained. I mentioned Eisenhower's anger. Um, this is probably scholars consider like one of the greatest you know breaches in that post-war period between the United States uh, and Britain. And Nasser himself is going to be even more you know um, more entrenched in power. Something again that. Britain and France were hoping it wouldn't happen and we're hoping maybe this would actually topple him. Mm -hmm. um, but the exact opposite happens. He's even stronger. So uh, basically this is a disaster. You see basically kind of a, a shipwreck um, uh, of different things for Britain uh, and for France. And Eden, uh, the prime minister of Britain, he will end up resigning by the end of the year uh, because of this whole, uh, whole fiasco. Wow, goodness. I mean, it's almost like who really created the crisis, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Britain and France have a lot on their, their hands then to try and figure out and correct. And I'm sure the fact that they risked that um, relationship with the U.S., especially for Britain, did not bode well. Um, so... Uh, I'll, I'll so I, just, I really, you just brought up a point about the relationship with Britain and France or with the, with the U.S. I, I will say um, from Britain and France perspective, they thought that maybe once they misread the United States in the sense mm. that they thought that once um, they did engage in military operation, that um, the U.S. would, you know, they might not be happy with it, but they'll, they'll go along with it because they actually maybe the thinking was the U.S. actually supported the goals, right? They didn't like Nasser. They wouldn't be overly upset, right, if he was overthrown and, and the canal is no longer in his control. Um, so they underestimated the anger and the swift response the United States would take, which even shows among allies, um, even in the UK, British uh, and UK, US instance, you know, allies that are close, speak the same language, uh, you can still misperceive uh, what your counterparts might do. Yeah, miscalculation for sure. So how does this change? Not, you know, I know we really want to talk about sort of the impact of this event, um, the consequences of it. So how does this change? You've mentioned a little bit of the dynamics between the U.S. and Britain, but how does it change the dynamics in the region or with yeah. some of the other players? Yeah. So really interestingly, the U.S. is going to find itself on the same side of the Soviets um, rather than its allies. And it found itself in the opposition of protecting Nasser. Um, and you get this cartoon right here, kind of this collaboration between Nasser and, and the Soviets with Khrushchev. And the United States, in some ways, you, you could almost maybe throw in Eisenhower standing there with him to some degree. Obviously, he's not trying to increase the, the, the tension in the region, but he does in this, this crisis side with, with them um, because he has, um, he doesn't think it's in the US interest, right, to, to go along and support um, US allies. Um, now, that doesn't mean the U.S. and the Soviets see them eye to eye in everything during this crisis in the region. Um, the Soviets will put forth a, um, a proposal for like kind of joint action between the U.S. and the Soviet Union to maybe, um, you know, maintain the peace and, and try to, you know, with, um, expel right, these foreign forces. Um, the U.S. will reject that. Um, and also just kind of a side note too, it took the, U, uh, the Soviet Union a little while to actually get involved here um, because they had to own issues they were dealing with in Eastern Europe. But once they did, um, Khrushchev will send threatening letters to Israel, the Britain and France, basically kind of threatening military action. Um, many thought that might've been a bluff, but you know, Eisenhower has to take that seriously and does send kind of a stern letter to the Soviets um, mm -hmm. trying to deter them from any action. Um, but yeah, I do think it's this weird, these odd bed, bedfellows because yeah. of that. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think in the short term, that's that's what occurs. Um, and then long term, I don't know if you want to talk about the long term consequences now. Or do we have that for a different sure. state, potentially? Well, I, you know, I'll just, okay. you know, yeah. think about how the U.S. is positioning themselves with NASA as well. Yeah. So. Um, I should know, like, once military action is, is underway, um, a new round of diplomacy begins. And the United States is going to really mm -hmm. take, um, you know, swift action here. They're going to, as I mentioned, put great pressure on, on their allies, especially with not giving them oil, not going to help them pop up their economy. Um, and the U.S. will take this to the U.N. Um, they'll try, introduce a resolution, the U.N. Security Council, um, you know, advocating for a ceasefire, withdrawal of, um, you know, foreign forces, um, but that will be vetoed, actually. So, so Britain and France issue their first um, UN Security Council veto. Uh, and so what the United States does is then just takes it to the General Assembly, where Britain and France don't have that veto. And it's passed by um, a U.S. resolution is passed by overwhelming margins, um, you know, saying ceasefire, withdrawal, those kind of things. Um, and then the United, um, the United Nations also comes up with this idea for an emergency force, which will basically send a UN force to kind of separate the combatants and, um, you know, make sure everyone's complying with, 
with the terms of these, these resolutions. And Britain and France will, um, under pressure, um, will withdraw, and as will Israel. Um, and then, yeah, I think about impacts on the region at large, um, you can see here, um, you know, Eisenhower and Nasser look like they're getting along. This is 1960, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. 1960. Um, they're getting along. Um, but in some ways, that's kind of a bit misleading because the United States, right, with British prestige badly damaged in the region, um, the U.S. feels the need to be more, uh, more active, maybe to prevent a power vacuum, prevent um, maybe greater Soviet involvement in the region. And so, in 1957, Nasser, I mean, um, Eisenhower will announce the Eisenhower Doctrine, uh, basically saying that um, any country fearing Soviet aggression could rely on the United States for help. Um, but in some ways, the Soviet aggression was also um, code word for like um, Nasserite aggression. So basically, forces that might be inspired by Nasser's nationalism, um, the United States might also help out countries resist that. Uh, and so the United States, they, they kind of take on this greater role in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and I should note, the United States, their image does improve because they did stand up to these Western powers, these former colonial powers. So the United States does get a boost in their prestige in the region, um, in the aftermath. Um, but that focus on, you know, the fear of communism in the Middle East kind of goes away a little bit just because there's other concerns in the world. In the 1960s, we'll have crises in Berlin and then you have Vietnam growing. Um, so they kind of, um, you know, shift, shift their focus and emphasis a little bit. Uh, and that United Nations Emergency Force I mentioned, um, they actually do a really good job of uh, maintaining peace between Israel and Egypt. And so the threat of another Arab-Israeli war really kind of declines um, in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, uh, but yeah. Wow. It's just all of these dimensions to this, you know, and as you stated at the top of the program where you have all of these world powers just um, with their own perspectives on this event and how it impacted and the different choices they all wanted to make. And through diplomacy, how do you try to get everybody on the same page? Sure. Um, I just wanted, this is our last slide and I did oh. want to pull this up because it signals how the U.S. was stepping up as that leader in the region. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, so I mentioned, um, right, there was this fear of this power vacuum. Um, and not again, again, not only over the communists, but also there's just this kind of fear still, of, um, you know, uh, these nationalists kind of inspired by Nasser, maybe um, created instability. And so the United States is kind of like a counterweight to Nasser. They didn't necessarily say this publicly, but as a counterweight to Nasser, I'm trying to build up more conservative regimes in the region like Saudi Arabia. And so, yeah, you can hear, see here, um, you know, in 1957, you know, shortly after the, the Suez crisis, um, United States um, welcoming the king there for a, a formal state visit. So yeah, the United States will try to build up more conservative Arab regimes like Saudi Arabia to kind of uh, combat that uh, revolutionary nationalism um, that Nasser represented. Incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I know I see some questions coming in from our audience. Um, and before um, we take the slides from the screen, I just wanted to um, put up the QR code here of the simulation that um, Dr. Chavez helped contributed to. And this simulation, if you're interested in bringing this incredible crisis into your own classroom and allow your students to step into some of these roles to themselves try and figure it out and use those skills of diplomacy and negotiation and areas of commonality that they could find solution. Um, we encourage you to do so. There's the QR code so you can um, access those materials yourself. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, Dr. Chavez, thank you so much. What an incredible story that is actually, I mean, so much so that it's almost like you, you, you couldn't have written that, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it has so many different interesting characters and dimensions to, um, to it. I do have a question coming in and this one is what happened to President Nasser? Yeah, so Nasser will stay in power until his death in 1970. And, and really, he's kind of the big winner from uh, the Suez crisis. Um, militarily, it's a huge defeat because, you know, Israeli forces, you know, defeat his um, Egyptian army, um, you know, attacked by Britain and France. So militarily, big defeat, but he can rely on the Soviets and maybe rebuild his army. Um, but yeah, his, more importantly, his prestige greatly increased, was enhanced. I think I mentioned that. And he's more secure in his power in Egypt now and the undisputed leader kind of in the Arab world. Um, and even in 1958, um, I believe, Egypt and Syria will form a union, um, the United Arab Republic. It's short-lived, but it gets this idea that he's a popular figure in other countries, people in other countries might wanna be associated with Egypt uh, mm -hmm. and with him. 
Um, and so, yeah, he'll be in power till his death in 1970. Um, but the biggest thing he kind of does next is in 1967, um, that UN emergency force that has been there since the Suez crisis, he will ask that, ask them to leave. Uh, and that will kind of open the door for another Arab Israeli conflict, which will really end in disaster for, uh, for Egypt. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So reper- you can see how the repercussions roll out of this Suez Canal crisis event. Um, who control, here's another question, who controls the dam today? Yeah, so the dam today is still controlled by Egypt. Um, the Suez Canal Authority replaced the Suez Canal Company um, when, when it was nationalized. So yeah, they, Egypt still controls the canal. Um, you know, it's still um, obviously a major international waterway, billion dollars worth of revenue um, go through uh, the, for, for the canal, um, canal authority there. Um, and as we saw earlier this year, right, when a ship got stuck, I really did hamper a lot of global trade. You had hundreds of ships kind of like waiting um, to pass through as this this massive ship needed to be uh, removed. Um, And so, yeah, it's still a a vital international artery uh, today. And you can imagine if, you know, there was a conflict, if there was, you know, the canal did get closed, uh, that would be, you know, really disruptful uh, for the global economy um, and, and, you know, would force countries to try to, to reopen it. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. Uh, last question. So which diplomatic relationship do you think suffered the most because of this crisis? So I guess when you look at the, the different world powers that are a part of this story, which relationship do you think suffered the most? Um, I think initially it was um, obviously the United States with, uh, with Britain and France, right? It's, it's NATO allies. However, interestingly, they rebound quite quickly. And so like the, the, the thinking is that it was kind of really a low point, post-war low point kind of in relationship, um, relations between allies there. Um, but yeah, with, you know, once Eden's gone, the new prime minister in Britain makes it a point to really, um, you know, reconcile with the United States. And the United States itself also has a big um, incentive, right, to, 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 to make nice with their former allies because you're still fighting this larger uh, larger Cold War. You don't want to be too, um, you know, detached from your allies. Uh, I would say, you know, obviously the Soviets supported um, Egypt, but in some ways there's also a tension there because early in the conflict, Egypt was asking for Soviet help or at least a firm statement of Soviet support, um, but the Soviets were distracted in Eastern Europe, and so the Soviets didn't really get involved till late. And so in the future, you know, Nasser really doesn't really give much credit to the Soviets in this conflict, uh, and Khrushchev you know, wants more credit. And so even though they remain, um, you know, kind of allies, I would say it's not, maybe that they're kind of cool to each other in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, I think the biggest one is, is the U.S. with its European allies, mm-hmm. but um, those actually recover pretty quickly. Right. Well, it also, um, what, what's highlighted for me is this idea that even though uh, relationships might have been soured temporarily, you have to keep talking. Um, it's really important to maintain those conversations um, between governments to, even though you may not agree, but it's really important to keep talking and sharing ideas and, and ways in which you want to approach a problem. Yeah. And I just thinking on that kind of point you raised, um, you know, I think with this crisis kind of, you know, like a let, I want to say a lesson from the crisis in some ways is that even in wartime, um, diplomacy functions, right? Even, in, um, because obviously diplomacy, we think of diplomacy as, as the peaceful resolution of things, which it, which it is, um, but once that conflict, once the shooting started in this conflict, right, that um, launched the United States to a whole other round of diplomacy. And so just because, you know, um, you know, countries might resort to force, that doesn't mean the diplomatic element totally goes away. And diplomacy is still there, um, even in the midst of warfare. Uh, and so we shouldn't just think of it as like, um, you know, something that happens before war and then just goes away. It is something that is an ongoing process in peace and war. Excellent. That is such a great way to end this program. Tisok, thank you so much for taking the time um, to be with us to help us better understand the diplomacy in this event, um, its impact and where we are today, the importance of international waterways. So thank you so much. Um, And thank you all uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you at future programs. And until then, everyone take care. Thank you so much.